Okay, let's start with a, uh, with a would you rather. Uh, would you rather have no eyebrows or only one eyebrow? Uh, no oh, one. I can't fill them in, so no eyebrows. Yeah, yeah. no, because then you can fill them in even. You can do the microblade thing. Yeah. Get them tattooed on. Mm -hmm. okay. Anybody want to have just one eyebrow? Maybe you could like shave it in the middle. Yeah, but what if it ends like right here? Like, what if your eyebrow's in the middle and then you shave it and then it'll be like this big? <laughs> <laughs> or what if you just have like one eyebrow on one side? Yeah, that'll suck. Yeah. Then you could draw the other one in. I guess you have to shave it and draw it. I don't know. There's no good answer here. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so let's jump in with the digestive system. Uh, very quickly, for those of you who uh, want the opportunity for extra credit on the next test. Uh, the Nerdy by Nature video is called Sugar Hiding in Plain Sight. It's a TED Ed video and uh, it discusses uh, sugar in food, both natural as well as added sugars. It talks a little bit about why it's so difficult to figure out sugar content in food. According to food labeling laws, you have to disclose it, but there's all kinds of different names for sugars. Uh, and it even talks a little bit about uh, why um, some sugars are quote unquote better than others for the body uh, in terms of how they're metabolized. So it's again, it's about a four and a half. No, it's a, I'm looking at it right now. I think it's a four minute video. Uh, so if you have time today during break or lunch or after school, or you just want to devote your entire weekend to watching the video over and over and over again, uh, it's only four minutes out of your life. And, uh, it will be on, there will be an extra credit question on the next test on this. Okay, um, <clears throat> so let's jump in with, uh, with digestion. Uh, and so in a very, very big sense or a big picture sense, um, digestive systems are uh, integral to uh, all animals. One of the defining characteristics of the kingdom animalia is, uh, that they're heterotrophs. Sorry, I'm trying to bring up my pointer. Hold on, I just have a laser pointer. That doesn't make any I guess. Um, so one of the defining characteristics of the kingdom animalia is that they're heterotrophs. That means, of course, that they are other eaters. That means that in order to get uh, enough of the nutrients, energy, and building blocks that they need to sustain themselves, they need to ingest um, parts of other organisms, whether they're plant-based, if you're a herbivore, uh, meat-based, if you're a carnivore, or omnivores, uh, again, uh, all animals, the one, one of the uniting characteristics of them is that they are all heterotrophs and they all ingest parts of other organisms in order to sustain their, their um, metabolic processes, growth, reproduction, and so on. Um, so that means that they have to have a mechanism, a perhaps organ or organ system, which is dedicated or devoted to extracting nutrients and energy out of the foods that they consume. And this is the, the responsibility of the digestive systems. Uh, and so if I can bring you back to something you learned about in uh, first semester, uh, remember that all living things are built of or made from the four major types of building blocks, the carbs, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. Um, I spent a long time back in the fall distinguishing between the monomers and the polymers of those four types of macromolecules. And the reason is actually important in terms of digestion. Um, we all need each of these four macromolecules. However, if you were to ingest um, polysaccharides, raw polysaccharides, and you didn't have a way of breaking those things down, they would um, basically pass through your digestive system or your body um, without you being able to absorb and utilize any of them. So one of the main functions of an efficient digestive system is to take the polymers, which are generally present 
um, that's the form that most of these molecules are going to take in living things. You have to take those polymers and break them down into these monosaccharide forms. Only then can the nutrients be absorbed, circulated, and used by the body. As an example, if you remember, uh, lactose is a disaccharide. For crying out loud, it's two uh, you know, molecules of sugar linked together. And that by itself is too large to be absorbed through the digestive system or the digestive tract. You have to have lactase to break it down into two monomers. So, I mean, we're talking about two super, super small molecules that are joined together. And even those molecules of lactose are too large. You have to break them down into the two simple monosaccharides in order for them to be absorbed and used by the digestive system. So part of the digestive process then is ingesting and then mechanically breaking the food down into smaller pieces. You tear it, you shred it, uh, you grind it, you pulverize it. And um, the mechanical process of digestion is essentially trying to take large bits of food, pull them into smaller pieces, so you have more surface area that you can expose to the chemicals that are released in the digestive system. And the chemicals, generally enzymes, uh, are the ones that break the polymers in those pieces of food down into the monomers so that they can be absorbed. Okay. And uh, another slide that sort of uh, emphasizes that process again, that you have to take the polymers and break them down. Uh, all animals, uh, from the textbook, but it sort of explains that uh, there's four basic steps in the digestive process. And obviously, you have to ingest it, um, whether you have a jaw and tear, grind, and pull, or take down the food and, 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 and um, put it into your body, or whether you're simply a sponge and you filter feed, or, uh, filter feed things, you have to ingest the food, uh, then you have to digest it either chemically and or mechanically. Then uh, once the molecules in the food are in their monomer form, you can absorb them. And then uh, because no digestive system is 100% efficient, there's always some waste and waste material which is undigested and therefore eliminated out of the body. Um, and there's the process in text form. Uh, and so what we're going to focus on today is the digestive system in vertebrates and more specifically in humans, and I guess more specifically on this slide in Kanye West. Uh, now remember that not all animals have a digestive system which is as complicated, I suppose, as uh, mammals or as humans. But again, if I go back two slides, this, these four steps are all pretty much the same whether you have an alimentary canal, which is one big, long, continuous tube through which food moves, or whether you're more like uh, a nadarian, which um, has a gastrovascular cavity. They don't have an alimentary canal. They basically uh, take food into this central cavity, uh, expose it to digestive enzymes, uh, absorb what they can, and then undigestive waste is passed out through the same opening into which food uh, entered in the first place. Again, uh, this is a little bit different than our alimentary canal. We have a distinct mouth and a distinct anus, two different openings, and food moves from one uh, end of the tube down through the other. And one of the advantages, my friends, of having this sort of sophisticated alimentary canal is that you can see all these accessory organs that are attached to it. You can't really have all these, like a liver and a gallbladder and a pancreas um, inside uh, an idarian or a sponge. It's really just a central cavity and you just squirt enzymes into it. But if you have an alimentary canal, you can start attaching more complicated organs that start to do specialized tasks to process the food as it moves along through that alimentary canal. And incidentally, not all animals have an alimentary ca canal. So if you remember our unit on the diversity of life and specifically animals, the invertebrate phyla, not all invertebrates have this. So platyhelminthes don't have this. Cnidarians don't have this, right? The jellyfish. Sponges certainly don't have this. We don't really start to see an alimentary canal 
until we start to get into some of the worms like the nematodes. Oakley Doakley, still with me? All right. Um, here's a really complicated alimentary canal. Uh, cows uh, and other ungulates, which eat primarily grass and um, plant matter, which is very, very high in cellulose, have a fairly complicated alimentary canal and digestive system because the grass that they eat is, um, the cellulose is really mostly indigestible. And so the longer and more complicated this digestive system is, the more chambers there are in the stomach, the more opportunities there are to uh, break that mostly indigestible cellulose down. In fact, um, in um, one of the stomachs of the cow, they expose the cellulose to some digestive enzymes from bacteria, and then they actually regurgitate the semi-digested grass back up, chew it up some more with these big, huge crushing molars that they have, and swallow it again. So they're basically digesting, grinding it again, swallowing it, and digesting it even some more. It's called chewing the cud. Like, have you guys heard of the term chewing your cud? No? How many of you were aware of the fact that cows regurgitate uh, food that they eat at least once? Emma did. Emma knew that. Farrah's shaking her head in disgust. Okay. Um, so again, we're going to turn our attention to the human digestive system. And um, we're going to start, because the alimentary canal has an opening and an ending, and food always moves unidirectionally. In other words, we don't put food up the other end and move it backwards. Uh, we're going to start where we logically start the digestive process, which is in the mouth. Um, as we move through the digestive system, here's what you should pay attention to. Think about uh, where food is mechanically digested. Then think about where food is chemically digested. Right, so there's again two processes. Mechanical is anything that exerts mechanical or physical force on the food, whether it's something like teeth or whether it's even something like your stomach, uh, mashing and mincing and, and mixing the food around. That's still a form of mechanical digestion. But anything that involves the addition of an enzyme is chemical digestion. And you may be surprised to learn that chemical digestion happens at almost every step through the alimentary canal, not just in the small intestine. Uh, so let's go through the, uh, through the digestive system. Let's start with the mouth. Um, so uh, animals have, uh, at least uh, vertebrates have um, uh, teeth, which are used not just to bite uh, pieces of food off, but also to help mechanically grind them up. In fact, we have different kinds of teeth that are specialized for different tasks. And you probably know this, the teeth that you have that you can see when you smile are called your incisors. And those are mostly used for um, clamping down on a piece of food and, and tearing it off, right? You don't do a whole lot of, of grinding up food with your front teeth. You also have canine teeth. Animals that have a largely carnivorous diet have even larger canine teeth for um, uh, capturing, subduing pay, prey, and then tearing off food, uh, uh, meat. But then you have uh, molars in the back of your mouth, which are used for grinding the food up. And the more herbivorous your diet is, the more molars and the flatter those molars are, right? So think about deer. Um, deer don't have uh, canine teeth because they're not carnivores. They do have some big uh, incisors for tearing grass or uh, vegetation, but then they have these big grinding molars in the back of their mouth that they use to, to um, grind up the, the uh, herbivorous food that they consume. Um, you also have a muscular tongue. The tongue does a couple of things. It helps to push and move the food around and exposing it to the molars. Uh, and uh, the second thing the tongue does is to push the food into the back of the throat. Uh, to, and that's what you obviously know is swallowing. We'll talk about swallowing in a second. Uh, and so that's the mechanical digestion part, but you also have um, some salivary glands above and below the, the mouth or above and below the tongue that squirt in saliva. Now saliva is mostly water, but uh, you may recall from earlier in the year that saliva also contains 
uh, an enzyme called amylase. Who remembers what amylase does? Actually, it's right there on the slide if you, can, <laughs> you could read it. Breaks down starch. Breaks down starch, right? And do you mind remember what the monomers of starch are? Oh, I know, that was months ago. Glucose? Glucose! Michelle is on fire today. So yeah, we begin the process of digesting starch with salivary amylase. Again, if you wanted to, to, to try eating some saltines or soda crackers or those the little oyster crackers you get with soup, if you wanted to put those in your mouth and chew them around and don't swallow them, leave them in there for three or four minutes, they'll actually start to taste a little bit sweet. I mean, not like pixie stick sweet, but they'll start to taste sweet because they're mostly starch and you're breaking that starch down with salivary amylase. Okay, um, really quickly about swallowing. This is kind of a, a, a sort of an interesting uh, anatomical feature that connects the respiratory and the digestive systems together. Um, next week, when we talk about the respiratory system, we're gonna talk about the larynx and the trachea. Uh, and within the larynx, you have a voice box, but the, basically your, your trachea, if you feel the front of your throat down um, slightly below your Adam's apple, you can feel your trachea, these little bumps that are just under the skin. That, that's your trachea, and it's a tube that's constantly held open by rings of cartilage. You don't ever want your trachea to collapse. So the cartilaginous rings hold it open. It's, it is, you know, the common name for your trachea is your air pipe or your windpipe, um, because it is essentially a pipe which is held open with these big rings of cartilage all the way down the length of it. Um, so air should only ever enter the trachea and the larynx because its final destination is, is the lungs. But interestingly, we have in the back of our throats a connection between, because we breathe with our, our mouth and we also eat and drink with our mouth. And so liquid, solids, and air all go down the back of the throat, but we only want air to enter the larynx and then the trachea. It's not the end of the world, by the way, if we have a little bit of air that, that enters our stomach. In fact, when we eat and we swallow, we always typically swallow a little bit of air together with some of the food we eat. It's not the end of the world. What could be the end of the world is if you swallowed a, a glass of water and instead of having that water go down the esophagus and into the stomach, it uh, took a little uh, a right turn and went down into your lungs. That's basically drowning. So what we want then is the ability to divert food and liquids down into the stomach through the esophagus rather than down into the lungs. If you've ever choked on food, you've actually managed to get a small piece or maybe even a large piece of food right down here in the larynx, into the trachea, and you're now blocking air from getting into your lungs. It's not a very comfortable feeling. You immediately start to choke, and the Heimlich maneuver is actually when somebody reaches around behind you and pulls up underneath your diaphragm, which basically forces air that's in the lungs out violently, help, hoping to dislodge that food that's stuck in the larynx. In other words, it's not good. It's not good to get food or water down here. So here's how the process works. I know this is a long, long uh, conclusion coming, but basically we have in the back of our throats this little flap called the epiglottis. And the epiglottis is um, more or less in this open position as you breathe. So the default position for your epiglottis is sort of upwards, and um, exposing the larynx because typically if you're not doing anything right now, you're probably breathing. So we want the, anything that comes in through the air and nose uh, and mouth, sorry, the nose and the mouth to go down the larynx. So this epiglottis is in the open position until, until you swallow. And once you swallow, the epiglottis um, uh, moves downward and closes over the trachea. And the um, end result is that anything that you swallow, whether it's water, food, or even saliva, when you're subconsciously swallowing, um, 
it's diverted down the esophagus and not into the larynx, into the voice box, or sorry, into the trachea and into the lungs. Now, it's not perfect. Uh, and sometimes we, you know, choke on water or choke on food uh, if we swallow perhaps too quickly for that epiglottis to close over it. But that's the way that that is supposed to work. And by the way, um, this is partly why you could stand on your head and still eat and drink. The epiglottis doesn't care about gravity. It's, it just cares about if you're swallowing, it pushes that epiglottis down. Uh, and you can still push food against the force of gravity. All right. So the nasty uh, mixture of saliva and food, uh, semi-masticated semi and, and crushed up and mixed together with amylase, it's now called the bolus. It's one of those nasty words in the English language like moist. Uh, at least I don't like the word bolus. But the bolus is now swallowed. All right, we spent enough time in the mouth. Um, we're ready to head down into the stomach. Here again is a graphic that simply shows the epiglottis in the upward position uh, when we're um, breathing. But then as soon as we swallow and push the food down, the epiglottis closes over the, um, the larynx and the trachea. And the food then squeezes its way down through the esophagus. And food continues to move down the esophagus by these rings of muscles that surround the esophagus. Uh, they're smooth muscles that we can't voluntarily control. They're under our unconscious or subconscious uh, uh, control. They basically squeeze and push the food uh, down into the stomach. This process is called peristalsis. And in fact, peristalsis is what basically moves food through the entire digestive system. You don't have to jump around and shake your body to move food through your digestive system. You have muscles which are doing it uh, without any of your voluntary, voluntary um, uh, you're not voluntarily uh, moving the food. Uh, and you have probably felt the, uh, the peristalsis uh, if you sometimes get a piece of food, like let's say you dry swallow a pill, or the worst offender of all for me is Doritos. If you sometimes if you chew a chunk of a Dorito and it kind of gets stuck in your esophagus and you can kind of feel your esophagus trying to push that rough edge Dorito down into your stomach. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Kind of, you can feel it kind of working its way down until it gets into your stomach. None of you eat Doritos. Or maybe you just chew them more than I do. In any event, that's the peristalsis. Um, and what's not shown in this graphic, what's important to realize is that there's actually right here. Can you guys, not if you can see my, my um, pointer. Okay, so right here, um, there's a, a contractile ring called a sphincter. And it actually closed, it's in the closed position as food moves down. The sphincter opens up, allows food into the stomach, and then it instantly closes behind it. And the sphincter is actually fairly important because it keeps not only food in the stomach, it keeps it from backing up through the esophagus, um, but it also keeps the gastric juice, which is in your stomach, from backing up the esophagus. And so let's talk about the stomach because there's a reason why we don't want gastric juice to, to move back up through our esophagus. It sometimes does, and it causes a lot of pain and discomfort. But we'll talk about that in a second. So let's talk about what's going on in the stomach. Stomach has bands of muscles that surround it, and it's constantly moving and churning and pulverizing the food. So there's a little more mechanical digestion happening here. Uh, also, though, we are doing a little bit of some um, uh, chemical digestion as well. Your stomach has cells which uh, create an enzyme called pepsin. And pepsin helps to break down protein. In fact, we talk about peptide bonds that hold amino acids together. Pepsin helps to break down uh, proteins by breaking those peptide bonds. So you help to chemically digest protein in the stomach, but your stomach famously produces an acid. Uh, and the acid it produces has a pH of about 1.5 to 2. So it's not like, you know, if you, if you were somehow to uh, 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 take a, a, a sample of the acid from your stomach and put it on your desk, 
it's not like that acid is so powerful that it's going to eat a hole through your desk, right? It's not crazy, crazy uh, uh, acidic, but it is a pH of about 1.5 to 2. And so the acid actually does a couple of things. The reason we produce stomach acid is primarily to kill bacteria. Everything that you put into your mouth, virtually everything, is going to be coated and covered with bacteria. And so um, the first place that food goes once you put it into your mouth and swallow it is into this big pit full of acid. And the acid actually kills the vast majority of bacteria that are in or on the food that we eat. So it's a disinfectant. It actually keeps potentially harmful bacteria from reaching the small intestines. It also does, to some extent, soften and, and um, not really digest, but it, more, it sort of uh, it softens up the food and together with the muscular contractions of the stomach, it helps to break it down mechanically a little bit more. And then of course we know that acid helps to denature proteins. So it uh, uh, helps also to chemically digest the, the proteins. Now, this um, uh, acid of about 1.5 to 2 is again, not so strongly acidic that it's immediately gonna start to burn holes in things. However, it can damage tissue. It can actually damage unprotected tissues in the digestive system. So that's the reason why we have that sphincter on one end of the stomach. It actually prevents gastric juice from um, coming back up the esophagus. Um, the stomach is protected from the acid it produces by making a layer of mucus. But the esophagus does not have that mucus layer. And so if acid backs up into the esophagus, it can actually cause a, a mild chemical burn on the, chemo, on the, the soft linings of the, of the esophagus. Um, and that does sometimes happen. Occasionally, the, the sphincter on the stomach can open up, a little acid can um, back its way up into the esophagus and then back into the stomach. And if that happens repeatedly, if it goes up and down and up and down and up and down, Eventually, you can start to feel some, some mild discomfort. And if it continues, it can actually cause a lot of discomfort because you're actually causing a little bit of a burn on the esophagus. We know this, or you know it, as heartburn. Has anybody had heartburn before? None of you? Maybe? Yeah, Ian's had it. Uh, it, it's um, aggravated by things like spicy foods. They, they think sometimes stress can cause it a little bit, uh, but it does feel, the reason they call it heartburn is because it actually feels uncomfortable above the stomach and almost up into the, the chest cavity and the thoracic cavity below your heart. Um, and sometimes people mistake a heart attack for heartburn and heartburn for heart attacks. Um, and so what they, they can do for it is to take an antacid. You could take something like Tums or um, uh, what's the pink stuff that people drink? Um, Pepto-Bismol. Pepto-Bismol, thank you. Uh, or milk and magnesia. These are things that help to coat the esophagus and also are um, uh, slightly uh, an antacid to help uh, minimize heartburn. And if you get it chronically, and some people have chronic heartburn almost every day, uh, you can take a pill like uh, Prilosec. Uh, and Prilosec actually helps to block the acid production in the stomach. Uh, it's not an antacid per se, but it, it lowers the amount of acid the stomach makes. There's another pill called Zantac that used to do that, but they just pulled Zantac off the shelves because I think there's... Do you guys remember why? I think there was a link between Zantac and cancer, but I can't remember. No, none of you heard the news in the last week or two? Somebody can Google it right now. Okay, um, so eventually then our food is, uh, spends about anywhere from 20 minutes to an hour or two in the stomach. Let's go back to the stomach for a quick, for a moment. Eventually the stomach contents are empty and they're pushed um, again, one direction down into the small intestine, um, which we'll talk about in a second. But if you go, say, three or four hours without eating, the stomach has been emptied at that point, but uh, it still continues to produce gastric juice. 
and uh, it still is mechanically churning away. And, and so what you now start to feel as hunger pains or your stomach growling is your stomach doing its mechanical digestion without food in it. It's churning, it's squeezing, and all it's squeezing is gastric juice and air. And so that gurgling noise that you hear, that growl that you hear when your stomach is, uh, is empty, is the result of mechanical digestion with nothing present. Uh, and it only seems to happen for me at um, moments when I'm trying to be really, really quiet. Like if you're taking an SAT or a final exam or a test in biology class, that seems to be when your stomach is growling the loudest. Um, but that's what stomach growling actually is. Okay, let's move on to the small intestine. Is everybody still with me? Okay, easy peasy, chicken squeezy so far. All right, so the small intestine is so named because it has a smaller diameter, not because it is shorter than the large intestine. The small intestine is actually about 18 feet long. Now think about that. You have in your bellies right now um, a single coil tube, which is 18 feet. So it's super, super convoluted and, and folded up on itself. And it's held in place by this connective tissue called mesentery. Um, but the... Uh, the upshot is then we have this very, very long tube. And because it's so long, there's some important stuff happening here. In fact, at this point, most of the food has been as mechanically digested as it's going to get. There still is a little bit of mechanical digestion that happens in the small intestine from peristalsis. It still is squeezing and mixing the food around. But what mostly happens in the small intestine is the vast majority of chemical digestion. Most of the enzymes that break down food are added in the small intestine. Not all, because remember, we've already added pepsin and amylase, but we add even more enzymes in the small intestine, and the vast majority of nutrients are absorbed in the small intestine. Now, we still have a large intestine that we'll get to later, but there is really no chemical digestion that happens, at least that benefits us in the large intestine. And there aren't really any nutrients that are absorbed, at least not from the food. So it's a really, really important tube. And the first part, the first 12 to 18 inches of that long tube is called the duodenum. And this is where the majority of chemical enzymes are added. So let's talk about the enzymes. The food that leaves the stomach is called chyme, and it's now gastric juice plus all the semi-digested food. And now the chyme is pulverized and um, moistened and squeezed together. And uh, at this point, we need to now expose it to those chemicals that'll break the polymers into monomers. So the first thing that could happen is if we have eaten something with lipids in it, the liver produces a substance called bile. I don't think, it, oh, there it is. It produces bile. Bile is uh, produced by the liver, but stored in a little pouch that's under the liver called the gallbladder. And then the gallbladder will release bile down the tube called the bile duct, which then empties into the small intestine right here. Now, what bile does, and this is kind of subtle, so bear with me and I'll, because it, it's an important distinction. Bile doesn't chemically digest fat. In other words, it doesn't break it into smaller and smaller and smaller bits in, in the sense that, say, starch is broken into glucose. What bile does is take large globs of lipid and separate them into little tiny droplets. Now, that's not necessarily chemical digestion. It's called emulsification. And you can see uh, the effects of emulsification. If you have, uh, say, water in your sink and you have some vegetable oil in it, well, because vegetable oil is hydrophobic, it all stays together in, in the water in your sink at the surface and in one large blob. And in order to more effectively digest a large blob of lipid, we need to separate it into smaller and smaller and smaller drops. It's that surface area to volume phenomenon. And so you can take a little bit of dish soap and squirt it into your sink of water and you can actually see the, the lipid in there separate or, or move apart. 
And so that's what bile actually does. It actually exposes more lipid to the, the enzymes called lipase. Lipase are enzymes we'll see, they're made by the pancreas, that can break the lipids actually down, that can actually digest it. So emulsification is not technically digestion, uh, at least not chemical digestion, it's more of separating food so that chemical digestion is more efficient. Are you with me on that? Now, if you've ever been sick to your stomach so much that you actually start to throw up, um, your stomach is completely empty, and I know you probably don't want to think about this, but if you've been so sick that you keep throwing up, um, and sometimes you throw up stuff, and, and you, if you look, you'll see it's, it's a little bit greenish. So it's basically kind of a little bit of gastric juice with green stuff in it. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Have you ever been that sick before? Yeah, a couple of you have. That green stuff that you're actually throwing up, you're now actually pulling up a little bit of, of liquid. Your stomach, when you throw up, by the way, is basically completely squeezing itself uh, in ways uh, that violently push fluid back up the esophagus where it's not supposed to go. But it, it recognizes that you've eaten something which is potentially toxic, um, and so it's trying to purge itself. So it pushes food up and out, and it sometimes, if, you're, if you continue to throw up after the stomach contents are completely gone, you can actually pull a little bit of bile up from the small intestine, and that's that greenish stuff that you throw up. Kind of gross. Okay, uh, so that's the, the gallbladder. Now, the pancreas, it turns out, is a, it is a super, 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 super important organ. I don't know if I said super enough, but it is a really important organ. Not only does it make insulin, which helps you to absorb sugar. Now, important to realize, your pancreas makes insulin, but insulin is not squirted into your intestines. Insulin is released by the pancreas into the bloodstream, and it's a hormone that travels through the body and affects the uh, cells in the body and their ability to absorb uh, 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 glucose. But it, it, so in that sense, it's an exocrine organ or it's a, it's a, um, it's a gland. Uh, but it's also uh, able to produce enzymes which are added to the small intestine. And it actually produces the following enzymes. It produces, actually, I think it's on the next slide. Well, it says three types of digestive enzymes. It, it produces lipase, L-I-P-A-S-E. Lipase digests lipids. It also produces important proteases. P-R-O-T-E-A-S-E. -E. Proteases break down proteins. It also produces a carbohydrates. What do you think carbohydrates breaks down? Carbohydrates. Carbohydrates. Excellent. So all of the chemical um, enzymes that are needed to break down food, so in addition to the pepsin made by the stomach and the amylase being made by the mouth, the pancreas makes even more chemical digestive enzymes, which it adds to the small intestine. All right. Last but not least, and this is another important job of the pancreas. I already said that if the stomach acid burps its way up into your esophagus, it can cause heartburn. However, stomach acid is constantly being squirted into the small intestine. Why isn't your stomach burned by the acid that it makes? Who remembers? It has mucus in it. It has mucus in it, excellent. There is no mucus production in the small intestine. So think about that for a second. It's basically a tube, just like the esophagus. And just like the esophagus, it doesn't make any mucus. So, and, and moreover, stomach acid is always leaving the stomach and entering the small intestine. So we could potentially have the same problem here. We're constantly moving acid or an acidic solution into an organ which doesn't have any natural protection. This is how the small intestine is able to avoid the issues of an acid constantly being squeezed into it. 
the pancreas produces a basic solution or an alkaline solution in addition to all the enzymes that it makes, which it pushes into the small intestine. And so the effect of this is as acid is pushed out, as the chyme squeezes into the small intestine, the pancreas produces its alkaline solution. The two of them mix together there and the acid and base, the, the acid is neutralized by the basic solution or the alkaline solution made by the pancreas. Pretty nifty. Uh, so yeah, if you wanted to perform surgery on yourself and remove an organ, probably the one that I would leave in there most certainly is your pancreas. Wait, what does the um, duodenum do again? So um, the duodenum uh, doesn't necessarily do anything. Uh, it's a name that we give uh, a region of the small intestine where uh, important enzymes and um, solutions are squirted in. It's the first 12 to 18 inches. And the reason we talk about this as being sort of a separate part of the small intestine is because it's the point where the duct from the pancreas and the duct from the gallbladder both release into or empty into the small intestine. So it's really just an, a region. There, you'll, we'll see um, there actually are names, there's the ileum and jejunum are two other names for other parts of the small intestine, which I don't care if you know, but the duodenum really is this really important first, say uh, 12 to 18 inches, where a lot of important enzymes are added to the small intestine. Make sense? Okay. And there's all the, uh, the text version of what we just talked about. And then here is a summary of all of the enzymes and the chemicals that are added through the entire digestive system. So we've talked about amylase being released in the mouth and down into the esophagus. The stomach makes proteases and stomach acid. The liver makes bile or bile salts, which emulsify fats. We have our pancreas, which makes all of these different um, uh, uh, digestive enzymes. I also didn't, I didn't talk about this, but it also makes nucleases, which help to break down DNA and RNA polymers. And then it also makes bicarbonate to help to neutralize the acid. So lots and lots and lots of chemical digestion at this point. Okay, so now as food moves through the small intestine, we'll, we'll wrap this up fairly quickly here. Um, nutrients are absorbed. Once we break those polymers down into their monomers, they're now small enough that they could pass through the abdominal wall and into the bloodstream. In fact, your small intestine is really heavily vascularized. It has lots and lots of blood vessels that feed into it because we need to take the nutrients and then move them into the blood so we can circulate them around the body. Um, quick uh, sort of evolutionary connection here. The small intestine is not a smooth tube on the inside. It's actually super bumpy and really heavily folded. We call these villi from the Latin word villus, which means, I think, uh, a tall house. So they look like tall houses. So they're folded up. And then even if you look at the folds, microscopically, the cells that are along these folds have folds on them. They have folds upon folds. And these are called microvilli. Can you remember from an evolutionary perspective what the advantage is to having anything that's folded in your body? I'll give you another example. You have taste buds on your tongue. So instead of having a completely flat tongue, we have all these little teeny tiny folds and bumps all the way along our tongues. Why would we want lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of these? Why would we just have like just a simple single taste bud along our entire tongue? Or you can taste multiple things. Taste multiple things. Ian, what were you gonna say? Just like more surface area. So More surface area. 100% right. All right. So if you have, if this is your surface area of your small intestine, as food's moving along, you could absorb nutrients. But if you want to maximize your surface area, you have these folds, right? So if this is the area that you have on your, on your tongue, I don't know if you can see my video or not, but if you have a flat surface, right, nutrients can be absorbed. But if you have all sorts of folds, there's more surface area that 
um, could potentially uh, absorb nutrients. We're basically making absorption more efficient. Now, uh, here's our villi and microvilli. Food, then nutrients are absorbed into the blood. And watch, follow the blood here. Blood is entering the small intestines. We have a, a capillary or small blood vessel that runs along the villus. And all the way along the length here, food could potentially, or nutrients could be absorbed into the blood. It then loops around and comes back down the other side. Again, more opportunities to absorb nutrients. And then um, the blood, instead of going further along, it actually now starts to head back into the body for general circulation. So we have all these blood vessels that fold up and around in the, the villi, absorb nutrients, and then they're carried back out of the digestive system. And before they actually go into general circulation of the body, they enter the liver first uh, because the liver has an important function to detoxify things in the blood. So before we circulate blood, which comes from our digestive system into our bodies, where maybe we've absorbed something toxic, we send it first to the, to the liver. It's like customs and immigration, I guess. <laughs> Make sure nobody dangerous is getting in. Uh, so we um, uh, send it to the liver. It detoxifies what it can, and then it goes to the heart and then to the rest of the body. Okay, we're almost done. Large intestine. Um, so here's our small intestine, heavily folded. Um, it's hard to follow where all the stuff is going in the small intestine because it's all so folded up on each other. But then the large intestine has a really simple shape. Watch this. Food always comes into the large intestine on, for you. If you anatomically, if you reach down just above your hip on your right hand side, that is the large intestine where it meets the small intestine right here. There's a junction, right? You can see it right here in the, in the blow up. Small intestine meets large intestine. Food comes into the large intestine, and this little pouch here is actually called the cecum. And then the food comes up. This is, this is called, the, collectively, your large intestine is called your colon. It comes up the ascending colon. It goes across your abdomen, below your rib cage and your diaphragm, called the transverse colon. And then it comes down the other side called the descending colon. So it's really simple. Up across and down, and then you have a, a little pouch on the end uh, called the rectum. And so basically, at, by the time we move food through the small intestine, all of the nutrients have been absorbed. At this point, we take any remaining undigested food and we pass it through the large intestine, and mostly what your large intestine does is, is reclaim water. Digestion requires a lot of water and we want to reclaim it. Water is a valuable resource. So we reclaim water out of the large intestine as the semi-digested or partially or undigested food moves through it. We also, by the way, have a large population of bacteria that are reside in our large intestines. Have you guys heard of the term microbiome? Not so much. How many of you have heard of probiotics? How many of you deliberately eat things that are probiotic? Sophia does, good for you, Sophia, it's good for your health. Michelle, sort of. Um, what are some examples of probiotic foods? Yogurt. Kombucha. Kombucha, yogurt. Kimchi. Kimchi, sauerkraut. And it turns out that these foods, the one thing they all have in common is that they are packed full of microbes, bacteria. And the bacteria that live in your large intestine um, do a couple of important things. First, um, the, the uh, bacteria that live in here can um, synthesize important vitamins, like vitamin K. Second, they can actually help to further break down food Maybe you're not going to get too much out of it, but they can help break down things that have a lot of fiber in it, things that are really are hard to digest. They can help to break down fiber a little bit. Um, and in fact, if you eat things that are high in fiber, like beans, um, it's the, bean, the fiber in the beans is largely indigest, undigested in your small intestine. When it gets to your large intestine, the bacteria in there have a party. 
you've given them now a whole bunch of food and they really start to become active digesting the, the fiber. And one of the things that they produce, incidentally, is gas through their metabolism. And, uh, and this is why things like beans are called the magical fruit. Why do they call them the magical fruit? Nobody's heard that? Beans, beans, the magical fruit? Ian looks like he's melding it. Oh, I was just saying, yeah, I, I know what it is. The more you eat, the more you... Dude. Dude! Beans give you gas, right? So cabbage has a lot of uh, uh, undigestible fiber, which gives you gas. So anyway, it's not bad. I mean, it's a natural part of the digestive process, um, but it does, the microbes do help to digest those things. And the last things that these microbes do, and this is kind of important, they actually keep toxic, bad bacteria populations at bay. You have a normal, healthy flora of, di of uh, bacteria that live in your digestive system that should be there. And if you have a normal, healthy diet, you will have a normal, healthy flora of bacteria. And we're now starting to understand the importance in your overall health of having normal bacteria in your digestive systems. And if you eat the wrong kinds of foods over long periods of time and your microbiome changes, or if you have diseases where the, the normal biome is upset, you can actually have not just indigestion, but also health, um, chronic health conditions. And it's so important to have these bacteria in there that they can even, on some circum in some situations, they can actually do a fecal transplant. Fecal transplants are exactly what they sound like. They take poo from a normal healthy donor, somebody who has a normal gut biome. They filter out all the large chunky bits. So now you just basically have a liquid contained, containing mostly bacteria from a normal healthy person's gut. And then they use an enema, they put a tube back up into the large intestine and they pour the liquid containing the bacteria up into the recipient's large intestine. It is crazy, kind of disgusting to think about, but your microbiome, the gut bacteria that live in there are really important for a variety of things. Um, last but not least on this point, um, we all have this, unless we've had it surgically removed, a little dangly appendage um, at the end of where you're sort of at the beginning of your large intestine in the cecum area, this little nub called the appendix. And for a long time, surgeons and, bi and biologists and doctors said that the appendix was a vestigial organ, something that used to have a function and no longer does. That view has actually been challenged recently. And there are um, a number of physicians and researchers who believe the appendix does actually some important things um, specifically for your immune system. They actually help with um, the production of antibodies and the maturation of B cells, believe it or not. Uh, and there, there's some other proposed functions, but the appendix itself is con was considered vestigial. It's no longer considered to be a, a part of your body that used to have a function and no longer does. It, it is still believed to be important. That said, um, if you get some food, unfortunately lodged in there, and you get the inflammatory response happening. You get um, uh, some pus forming, bacterial action, macrophages in there doing their thing. Um, the appendix can become inflamed. And if it becomes super, super inflamed and you leave it untreated, it can actually burst or rupture, spreading the bacteria into the body itself. That's called sepsis, which can be deadly. So um, you can have, some people have had appendicitis where the appendix becomes inflamed. Normally, in my day, they would immediately go in and remove the appendix. Now, they try to treat, if they can, appendicitis with antibiotics. They actually think it's important enough that if they can, they can not do surgery and not take the appendix out, they'll just try and use antibiotics to kill the infection. If it is dangerously inflamed, though, they can remove the appendix. Has anybody had their appendix removed? Nobody? Huh. Tells you how uncommon it is. Same with tonsils. They used to do tonsillect tonsillectomies all the time when I was a kid. They don't do those very much anymore. Okie dokie. Uh, let's wrap this up. Here's your large intestine. 
Here's the uh, and, uh, ascending, transverse, descending. Um, the rectum, by the way, fills up with um, uh, undigested food that is now at the end of its journey. Uh, you can actually compact a large amount of, of this um, fecal matter at this point in, uh, uh, in your rectum. Uh, and you actually have stretch receptors in there that detect how much food is, is sort of backing up. And that gives you, once it sort of fills up, you have that sensation of, uh-oh, I've, I've got to go to the bathroom. And then you relax the anal sphincter, the muscle, at the very end of your um, uh, uh, elementary canal, and uh, the fecal matter is uh, released. That's your bowel movement. Okay. Uh, another couple of quick points. I'm almost done. I think you promised. Uh, and this is important to the case study we're going to do next week. Um, uh, not all digestive systems and elementary canals are the same. Uh, they're modified based on the type of diet that uh, the organism has. So we, my first slide talked about the differences between, say, uh, carnivores and herbivores. Well, herbivores eat things like this um, cute little adorable koala bear here eating eucalyptus leaves that are mostly cellulose. The cecum is a pouch which contains a lot of bacteria that help to digest cellulose. They contain the cellulase enzymes. Well, it turns out that, I don't know if this is a wolf or a coyote, they don't eat a whole lot of salad, so they don't have much use for a cecum. So their cecums, or ceca, I guess, are, uh, are very small. And in contrast, they have a very large small intestine for absorption. Uh, and there's my cow. All right, so these, that was it. Uh, here are the organs I think you should be familiar with. These are the last two slides of the PowerPoint. Um, you can expect on a test, I might ask you to identify some of these organs and tell me what they do. The two things I have in italics here, you don't have to know, for example, um, the cecum, even though I just mentioned it. It's uh, right here, because uh, we didn't talk a lot about its function. You don't have to know the cardiac sphincter valve, even though that's the sphincter I was talking about between the stomach and the esophagus. Um, here they are all labeled, and somebody was asking about the duodenum, and I mentioned the ileum and the jejunum. Uh, these are uh, other uh, areas of the small intestine, but I don't think it matters if you know what those are. Okay, uh, that was a super long presentation on the, uh, the digestive system. Does anybody have uh, any questions at this point? <laughs>